streaming on FIT. We're going to be sharing around a video afterwards um, in a follow-up email. So, um, so if you can't make the whole event or you have questions or, uh, or miss something, we'll have the recording to share around. Um, you can also share with others as well. So Elizabeth, nice to see you. Uh, Elizabeth has a PhD in theoretical physics from Cornell University and has worked on technical and policy issues related to nuclear weapons, missile defenses, and space weapons for over three decades. From 1992 to 2020, she worked at the Union of Concerned Scientists Global Security Program, first as a senior scientist and beginning in 2002 as a co-director of the program. Prior to that, she was a research fellow at the MIT Defense and Arms Control Studies Program and at the Center for International Security Studies at the University of Maryland. Elizabeth is a fellow of the American Physics Society and the American Association for the Advancements of Science. And I'm gonna spotlight you, Elizabeth, and uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for joining. Um, let me start out by telling you what sole authority is. When the military uh, decides it wants to consider using nuclear weapons, in fact, when it wants to use nuclear weapons, it has to get the approval of the president. The president is the only person who can make this decision. And um, that is why it's referred to as sole authority. He has the sole authority to, to order the use of nuclear weapons. Um, now, you might suppose that the military uh, is not all that keen on involving more than that person, but um, other countries do this. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little later um, which countries do and, uh, and how we might do it, how the US might do it. Now, there is a good aspect to sole authority. When nuclear weapons were first built, there was a, a little bit of a tussle uh, the military wanted to have the authority over these weapons, and others felt that it should be a, an authority by civilians. And the civilian side won out, as you know, and it is the president who must approve any military use of these weapons. Now, one incentive uh, for having one person only in, in the line of making this decision goes back to uh, something that the US and the Soviet Union started doing in the early 60s. They both deployed long range missiles in underground concrete silos that could reach the other country in about 30 to 35 minutes. Now, these weapons were basically sitting ducks. They were vulnerable to an attack by the other country's long range missiles. Um, and, and if the US uh, detected on its sensors that there was an incoming attack by Soviet missiles, its system would kick into place. The first step is that the computers would assess the signals from the radars, and then uh, after a little while, also satellite-based sensors that could detect the launch of the missile. Goes to the computer, computer spits out something. The first group of relatively low level, level officers takes a look. If they think that this is a credible attack, that what the computers are saying is makes sense to them, it goes up further. And again, if this group of higher level officials thinks it makes sense, they start to think about which of the options might be useful uh, or might be appropriate as a response to this incoming attack. It goes up again. And at this point, if this group decides the president needs to be involved because they do want to use nuclear weapons, they contact the president. Now, the time left over, remember you have 30 to 35 minutes between the launch of one uh, missile and the landing of that same missile. All these things take time. By the time it gets to the president, the president has some 10 to 15 minutes to be briefed by the military to ask questions, maybe have a very brief discussion and then decide on one or more of the, I get one, <laughs> of the options laid out by the president or to reject them all. And that has to happen, as I said, within 30, well, actually 25 to 30 minutes because they want to launch the US weapons 
several minutes before, before the other ones are scheduled to land. Now, um, various people call this launch on warning. Some people refer to it as a hair trigger alert, which is not the military's preferred term. But the fact is there have been false warnings. They have not gone up to the US president. There is indication that they did go up to President Yeltsin at one time. Uh, there has been no launch based on uh, this system, but as I said, there have been lots of false warnings. Um, and now there is a concern about cyber attacks, uh, I would say, and I think the military agrees. Um, so you can imagine if there's only 10 to 15 minutes for the president to get involved, the last thing anybody wants to do is add more people to that mix. It has seemed to be impossible. So why even consider it? Well, it's not impossible. I, along with my colleague, David Wright, uh, who also spent time at uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, now at MIT, and Stephen Fetter, who's at the University of Maryland, uh, came up with a scheme that we believe will work. Now, um, the US uh, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management uh, Association, keeps track of the president, the vice president, and a few more people in the presidential line of succession, speaker of the house, almost certainly, um, because it needs to know, and it, it maintains secure communication, the ability to communicate with these people securely. And it does that because it needs to know at every minute who the president is. So if the president dies, is captured, what have you, it immediately goes to the vice president. The vice president is now the president, is authorized to uh, approve the use of nuclear weapons. And so it goes. Um, as I said, I mean, if, it, if that transition takes place, you want the vice president to be prepared. So you have probably famously seen the president followed by uh, an aide uh, who is carrying a black suitcase, a black satchel, which over the years has gotten bigger and bigger. And that is uh, equipment that the president needs in order to communicate with uh, the war room. Okay, everything goes through the war room. That's the communication hub. So the vice president also has one, which is not, you know, photographed, um, but in fact is there so that if the president is no longer the president, the vice president will have their own ready to go. Uh, the same is true, uh, I believe, for the Speaker of the House. I'm not sure it goes all the way down to the Senate pro tem. But the reason this is advertised by the president's aide is because the US wants to make clear to Russia now that if Russia tried to take out the president, it would make no, no difference, that no matter what, the US has control over its nuclear weapons and has somebody to approve it. Um, so, of course, uh, as I said, the vice president and several people in the line of succession are also tracked at all times. Now there's no reason, so our proposal is that if for example, there is an attack heading uh, in the direction of Russian attack in the direction of US missiles, and this whole scenario that I laid out for you happens, the sensors detect it, the computer uh, analyzes it, it starts to go up, the president is briefed along with the next two people in the line of succession. At the end, the president presumably picks one of these things, one of these options, but it can only go forward if the other two people concur. They have a veto, okay? You might think, well, maybe it should be you know, a majority. No, we believe that this is such a momentous decision, really could affect the fate of the world would kill a lot of people, would destroy um, human society in certain countries at least. And this is a decision that no one person should be allowed to make. In fact, no one person should be asked to make it. 
and uh, having uh, requiring two other people to give their assent. This is not a discussion, okay? They're not talking about anything. At the end, the president says, I want option two, and the other people say, yes, yes, or no, yes, or no, no. Okay, that's our proposal. Um, as I said, other countries, including Russia, have a system where there is also not one person who makes this decision at the end. Um, so we think there are several reasons that the best way to do this is to include, is to make the other two people those in the line of succession. People have proposed that, well, maybe it could be the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State. No. The advantage of the next people in the line of succession is that they were elected, okay, and the president cannot fire them. Uh, unlike the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, the president could fire them on the spot. Um, so there is some aspect of democratic control. It's a little weak, <laughs> but these people were elected. Um, they are also, um, and because of that, they have already been put in this position of having to make this decision should the people above them resign or you know, otherwise be incapacitated. Um, and uh, let me say, uh, the democratic input, and uh, they can't, so those three reasons. Uh, political legitimacy, as I said, they're already in the line of people who get to, or who have to make this decision. Democratic input and independence. This would be a straightforward, way to do things. These people are already trapped. And adding them to the final decision making by, their, by asking for their agreement or veto would not take any time, any more time than it already takes to brief the president and make a decision. That's the plan that we have come up with. And I'm eager uh, to hear your uh, your response uh, and your questions. Thank you so much. Back to Jake. Yes, I'm going to uh, unpin you here. Ah. Excellent. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. We're going to save Q&A for the end, but if people have uh, questions that they'd like to put in the chat, please go ahead and the hosts will be able to see those questions and uh, we might be able to pick some of those out of the chat, as well as uh, some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Uh, next, I want to introduce UCS's own Stephen Young. Uh, Stephen Young is a senior Washington representative for the Global Security Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. He lobbies administration officials, members of Congress, and their staff to advance UCS security-related campaigns, uh, largely focusing on nuclear weapons policy and posture, spending on nuclear weapons, and ways to reduce the nuclear threat. He also works with scientists across the country to help amplify their concerns on critical national security policies and with journalists to expand and improve reporting on nuclear weapons issues. Uh, before joining UCS, Stephen was deputy director of the Coalition to Reduce Nuclear Dangers a National Alliance of 17 Nuclear Disarmament Organizations, um, and he has a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University. Thanks for being here, Stephen, and uh, I'm going to pin you so that everyone can see what you're up to and hear you. There we go. Thank you, Jake, and thanks everyone for joining with us today. Really glad you all made it uh, to talk about this important topic, which is the president's sole authority to start nuclear war. Um, so a question you might ask is, why are we advocating for this now, uh, given, for example, the U.S. is spending about $2 trillion to rebuild its entire nuclear arsenal, Russia and China are also expanding their nuclear arsenals, and Russia is making nuclear threats as part of its invasion of Ukraine, uh, why focus on the issue of sole authority, which seems to be relatively small, uh, and one, a couple of several reasons for that, I'll explain in, in some detail. Uh, first is, it's something we may, might be able to achieve. Uh, in the current environment, it's going to be very hard for us to try and stop, unfortunately, the massive U.S. plan to rebuild its nuclear stockpile 
or start pressure or China from working in their arsenals either. Um, but this is something that that possibly could achieve. Um, it is not still, I think, a challenge for us. It won't be easy to achieve this by any means, but it's possible for reasons I'll explain in the next few minutes. Um, and the first part of that reason, unfortunately, is Donald Trump. Uh, as long as Donald Trump is a candidate for president, this will be an issue. Uh, given who he is, his mercurial nature, his nuclear threats, saying things like, my button's bigger than his button, talking to um, the head of North Korea, or uh, he also said, uh, if we have nukes, why not use them? Uh, he is somebody who is clearly um, not cautious, you might say. Um, uh, so that's uh, people, many people are reasonably af afraid of having Trump as president with this authority that he has to launch a nuclear attack. And that view actually is shared by many in the military. And I'll tell you more about that right now. Um, so particularly, in, uh, the story we know is that um, on January 6th, the day after the attack on the Capitol, the day of the attack on the Capitol that Trump instigated, uh, Speaker Pelosi, the head of the House, House leader for Democrats, actually called General Milley, the head of the, the US Joint Chiefs of Staff, i.e. the most senior military leader in the United States to ask him about Trump. And he told her uh, that safeguards were in place that would prevent Trump from launching a nuclear attack, which is reassuring and also is true. But he was so, so concerned that as according to a book by Bob Woodward called Peril, um, on January 8th, he pulled together a meeting of senior military leaders and uh, asked them all to pledge to him that they would report to him immediately if they had any, any indication at all that President Trump was going to launch a nuclear strike. It's not the normal chain of command. That's not the way the process is supposed to work, as best we know. But he was asking them directly, explicitly, to contact him directly if they learned Trump was pondering a nuclear strike. So for that very reason, as long as Trump is around, uh, it's well worth thinking about sole authority and finding ways to try and change the system uh, so that he can't have that sole authority. Uh, second reason uh, is much more political than military, but again, tied to Trump. Um, and this is actually something that the Biden administration should think about doing because of Trump. Now, UCS is a nonpartisan organization, but the Biden administration, uh, given the president is running again for president, and likely against Trump as his candidate, uh, they will recall that when Clinton ran against Trump in 2016, one of the few issues that helped her against Trump was this very issue. They actually did a campaign ad in which the president, uh, Clinton, and actually, sorry, in which a former military launch officer, an Air Force officer who was in the launch tubes, uh, in the launch facilities by the launch tubes in the Midwest, North Dakota, um, did a commercial talking about the risk of having Trump in charge of nuclear weapons. And with that in mind, the president might think about this as a political winner for him, something that he could do in the next two years that would help make the country safer, while also winning him political points against the potential rival. Again, you see it's nonpartisan. We're not going to say president do this loudly in public because of it, for that reason, but they're smart. They'll figure it out um, themselves. And I think it's something they should definitely think about going forward. Uh, and finally, on the, the finally reason uh, for the Biden administration to think about doing this is they can do it themselves. There's no requirement that Congress be involved uh, in any way. There's no, this is something the president controls. He has control over this system of launch authority. It's not something that Congress uh, controls. The president himself can figure out and arrange a new system uh, himself. Uh, and secondly, uh, why it's possible he can do it now is because they haven't thought about it that much. As you may know, the Biden administration did something called a nuclear posture review, which every president since Clinton has done one of these. Uh, and basically it sets the administration's priorities for nuclear weapons policy and posture and their, during their term, as well as the number and types of nuclear weapons we will have. Um, so for example, in the nuclear posture review, the president decided, unfortunately, to not 
adopt the no first use policy that UCS and many others recommended. And in fact, for the record, Jake Roach, our host, asked President Biden when he was a candidate on the campaign trail if he still supported no first use policy. And Biden said, absolutely. He was very clear. He adamantly supports a US no first use policy. And Jake, if you can track it down, you the link in the, in, the, in the video with that um, great question you've asked of him. Uh, unfortunately, when it came to implementing that policy, he chose not to, largely because US allies and the US military objected. And so even though he personally supports a no first use policy, he decided it wasn't the time to do it um, given those for those reasons, which is I think a real problem. It's very disappointing to have a president personally support something and not have it made policy, but it's the reality we face um, that the president wanted to do first use, but chose not to for the reasons I outlined. However, so authority is something else, and that actually is not an issue they considered in nuclear posture review. So they have not rejected it. Therefore, we can argue it's still a possibility, something they can work on and do in the next two years. Um, again, not an easy lift, but it's a possibility that we should be pushing on and will be pushing on going forward. Um, now, Congress can have a role in this uh, by helping support President Biden make this decision. And so, for example, you could write to your member of Congress and ask your member of Congress to write to the president and tell Mr. President, we should please take this step to make us all safer. And in fact, we at UCS have already done that. Back in February 2021, uh, we drafted and sent to the Hill a letter, proposed letter from members of Congress to the president. And Jake can put it in the chat. So I'm just going to take a look at the letter. Um, the letter was um, ended up being co-sponsored by two members, Representative Pateta from California and Representative Liu, also from California, um, both of whom uh, signed the letter themselves and sent it to more colleagues. And in the end, we had about 30 members of the House who were alerted to the president, asking the president to reconsider the US sole authority posture and to consider changing it in ways that make it less um, risky. And in that letter, uh, included a description of the, the proposal this is the just outlined we developed. Um, so that is something that uh, like that would be useful to have more members of Congress weigh in with the president, telling him to end his own sole authority to start a nuclear war. There actually is one, just for your awareness, there actually is one piece of legislation in Congress already that is in this space. It's a bill from um, Senator Markey and Representative Liu that would basically require a congressional vote before any US first strike, um, which in some ways is an improvement before uh, the current system. It basically would say the president can't decide by himself or herself, um, Congress has to vote on it. Um, initially, we supported that bill at UCS, but eventually, and in fact, after Senator Warren, Massachusetts, and Representative Adam Smith from um, Oregon introduced a bill that would be called a no first use bill that would require, basically would prohibit first use of weapons. We reconsidered and decided we could not no longer endorse a bill that would authorize first strike because we believe fundamentally there are no scenarios in which first strike is appropriate. And so somewhat reluctantly, we decided not to endorse that bill at this time, um, while we instead focused on trying to have more support in Congress for no first use, which is a better policy, and also would help address the sole authority question in a different way. And that is about it. Um, uh, so I think Jake can give you some thoughts about how we can help push that issue ahead, but I'm happy to take questions on the topic as well. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Stephen. Let me just get you unpinned here. So we got a lot of questions ahead of time, um, but I also saw a question in the chat right towards the beginning that I wanted to ask both uh, of both you, uh, Elizabeth and Stephen. Um, what are the arguments against this proposal? Um, and also, if you, somebody would like the uh, succession line explained again. But yeah, is there any 
convincing arguments against this proposal of the, of the three uh, the three heads are better than one. Elizabeth, you're muted. If you're talking. Okay, I'm back. Uh, I think one of the arguments that people make is still that there's simply no time, which our proposal addresses. Um, the administration has not responded. Uh, I mean, to do so would acknowledge that what we have laid out merits consideration, uh, and they don't want to do that. Um, so I think there have not there have been very few objections offered, actually. Now, if you went in and talked to the military, I am sure there are a lot, um, but I don't actually know what they are. And then the question was about the presidential line of succession. So this was set up a long, long time ago. Uh, people recognized that if something happened to the president, that the, um, the US needed to know who the next president was, and they needed that to happen quickly. Uh, and they needed it to happen in a way that everybody would know. Um, so, you know, decades ago, I am sure that everything took longer. Um, they didn't have FEMA communicating and tracking everybody, but they do now. So the transition uh, from president to vice president is very quick as I laid out. So the vice president now becomes the president. If the vice president dies, the next person in the line is the speaker of the house. And then it goes to the Senate pro tem. And then it starts in on uh, uh, people that are appointed by the president in the order in which these departments were created. So it's the Department, I believe, of Commerce and then Department of State, Department of Transportation. Uh, I think the next one is Defense. So back in the day, the first department the US government created was, um, what did I just say? Commerce. So it goes down that line. If all the people on the top are killed, it goes down that line. In fact, when all those people are generally together, like a presidential address, a State of the Union address, they pick somebody who is not allowed to be there, usually pretty far down the line, and they put that person somewhere secure. And outside the door, or presumably outside that door, uh, is somebody with the suitcase. And if there is a bomb attack and all those people are dead, the new president is the person who has been sequestered, okay? So it's a big concern, especially on the part of the military and getting authorization to use nuclear weapons. They do not have a plan. They don't have a scheme whereby they can't reach the president, so they just go ahead. Um, so that is what I mean by the presidential line of succession. Thanks, Elizabeth. I didn't invent it, by the way. <laughs> Stephen, this question I think might be a good one for you. Uh, what legislative process does this have to go through? Is the current executive branch in favor of this idea? Yeah. So the the good news is that uh, Congress doesn't need does not need to be involved at all. I mentioned in my talk this is something that the president himself or herself, should we be like so lucky down the road, controls fully. And so the, the president can simply say, here's the new process for launching nuclear weapons uh, and can order that these people must agree with the order before it can be carried forward. Um, there's no reason why that could be um, uh, challenged by Congress in any way. Now, the, the unfortunate reality about Trump is if Biden himself does make a change to sole authority, uh, Trump could reverse that policy change, but it would be a signal that he did so and one that would clearly make it evidence that he's, again, somebody not to be trusted in many ways. So in fact, uh, our preferred scenario is that the president make a change in 
sole authority policy to add to people into the into the decision making process, and then that Congress, not because it has to, but because it can, makes that law. There's no way Congress will pass that themselves without the president doing first. There's no impetus. There's not enough agreement for them to do it. But if President Biden actually does it, the Senate might at least consider passing a bill endorsing that possibility. Given the Republican House, they will never do that currently. It might have happened under a Democratic House. Um, but that would be sort of the dream scenario is to have the president make that change and Congress then put it into law. Um, and what was the second part of the question, Jake? Was there a part two of the question? Um, I think we already know the answer, but just to, to make it clear, uh, what is the, well, is, is the current executive branch in favor of this idea? Um, so in talking with them about this many times, they basically aren't considering it very strongly. Um, I think they should, and I'm still encouraging them to do that. And I think if we get enough pressure, they will do it, um, given particularly the election and this, this reality I described of how it's an issue that favors them politically. Um, but right now, it's, it's simply not something on their window as a priority. But we're not giving up yet. We still have a couple of years before we have to have this, um, we have, before this window of opportunity, I think, um, fades away. So I think now is a good time to keep pushing on them. Can I just add that the reason they don't get to weigh in is that Congress has control over the budget. This, this does not involve the budget at all. So then it is under the authority of the administration. Thanks, Elizabeth. I have a question here. Um, I actually hear this a lot working on this issue and uh, Elizabeth would love to get your expertise on this. Um, it says, is it really that the, the POTUS can order a particular nuclear attack on their sole authority, or is it really that they can authorize their use and the military would then select a plan? Okay, uh, just for people who might not know, POTUS is president of the United States. Um, well, I have told you about what happens when the military wants to use a nuclear weapon that goes up for presidential agreement. Let's talk about the other direction. Um, the military swears its um, loyalty, not to the president, but to the constitution, which is very important. So the president, you know, they're not in the business of doing exactly what the president wants. So uh, if the president contacts the war room, which is where the communication all takes place and says, you know, I was thinking I, I, I want to bomb North Korea. Let's just get it over with. Um, now, this is an illegal act, and the U.S. military takes this very seriously, the laws of war. In fact, it has a gigantic group of lawyers. I mean, many, many lawyers. In fact, somebody has said to me, uh, they have the biggest law firm in the world, uh, and the job of these lawyers is to interpret uh, the laws of war in each conceivable case, so it will help them in the moment that something might be happening. It's it's available uh, online, actually. It's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Uh, the parts about nuclear weapons are redacted. These people, the, the lawyers actually join uh, commanders in the field. So if a commander says, you know, I think we should bomb that bridge. And the lawyer says, no, because it uh, it's military utility does not outweigh, in this case, the harm it would do to civilians. Now, there are three tenets of international law that would make it legal. Uh, one is military necessity of doing this. Are there other weapons that could serve as well that aren't as destructive? That they be able to distinguish between uh, military and civilian targets, which of course nuclear weapons can't. And that it's proportional. So, you know, if North Korea were to launch a nuclear, a one nuclear weapon at the United States, uh, it wouldn't even, the, U uh, the US would not even have the right to launch one in response because it's not necessary. It's not necessary. This has many, many other weapons that would do damage uh, to North Korea and uh, preclude its further launch. So what happens if the president calls 
Secretary of Defense says, well, this is what I want to do. Uh, he or she would say, well, I'm sorry, this is illegal. Um, can you tell me what the issue is that you're thinking of? And maybe we can come up with something that might be legal. Or, you know, maybe we should think about these factors. Um, it's not the case that the president calls and the whole process goes into reverse, which is good which is good. So the military is, not, in fact, there was a really interesting talk by General Mattis, who was the first Secretary of Defense under Trump. He was asked at a seminar, I think after he was not Secretary of Defense anymore, what would you do? What would you do if the president said, I, I wanna use nuclear weapons? And he said, well, I would tell the president it would be illegal. And then I would talk to him about, I mean, just what I said his concerns, what other options might be, um, you know, what, what, what factors I need to be considered and taken into account. Um, so we don't need to worry so much about whose finger is on the button because the military really would stop anything that was not legal under the laws of war. And it is hard to imagine that the president would really know enough to make a response legal because he doesn't or she doesn't have any independent information about a nuclear attack, about anything. It all comes from the military. So it's hard to imagine that this person could come up with a scheme that was lawful and use nuclear weapons. I think, I think that's it. What do you think, Jake? Is that, uh, does that uh, cover the, the uh, question? I think that covers that question and a few other questions we got here. So that was very okay. helpful. Thank you. Stephen, we had a question come in specifically for you saying, with a Republican. Oh, one more thing, oh, actually. Yeah. The president, whoever calls this order in, uh, it also has to be legitimate. Um, and that is re re a reference to the state of mind of the president. Yeah. I'm, I'm done now. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, Stephen, with a Republican-controlled House and a fairly evenly divided Senate, how realistic is it to think that legislation could be created that would pass both houses of Congress to be signed into law by the president, who would be agreeing to limit their own powers? Uh, good question. I sort of covered it. But again, I do think um, the ideal scenario is that first, President does it himself. Uh, that, that President Biden would himself say, I am changing the, the launch authority process and I'm going to require that the vice president and the speaker of the house agree with any launch order I issue. Um, and once he's done that, that the Congress could potentially follow suit. Um, but I think given the current Republican house, there's almost no chance that will actually happen. Um, I mean, that we we're actually, when we were talking about this earlier, um, oddly enough, bringing it up to Biden, some on the right were arguing it was us saying the president is incompetent and can't be trusted, and therefore we should do this because the, because Biden is incompetent, which is not the case at all. Um, but they potentially might see a political win for themselves uh, if they wanted to say, oh, Biden's incompetent, therefore we're going to take this power away from him ourselves. But they wouldn't do it if Biden wanted them to do it in that context. Um, so there's some chance of a political um, <laughs> angle for there from potentially, but I think it's unrealistic to think it could actually happen that way. Um, so again, the good news is the president doesn't require Congress to do this. Congress could do this. As Elizabeth said, it is nominally, their, their primary authority is the budget, but they can try and do things to that would limit president's authority. It might, a uh, president might object and take it to the Supreme Court and say, no, this is not, this is my authority, not theirs. Um, but if Congress, if the president endorsed it, it would go forward, I think, if Congress could do it, which is, as I said, unlikely. Thanks, Stephen. If you both don't mind, I might feel this next one. Uh, it's a, we got a lot of questions actually about what people can do, um, both online and how they can just help change policy and also on a broad range of nuclear weapons policy. So I'm going to put in the chat, you know, I, I, as an organizer with the Global Security Program, um, we're always working on ways to influence policy, to engage and educate. Uh, you know, the administration and members of Congress. Um, so there's a menu 
of actions you can take here, the link I just put in the chat for everybody. Um, there's a, you know, we are gonna include another action on a resolution that's in the house right now, uh, house resolution 77 in the follow-up email that goes out to everyone that registered for this. Um, oh, and I see that Elizabeth is still print, pinned, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm gonna leave it unpinned for everyone for a second, but um, yeah, so if you'd like, check out that page. There's a lot of uh, actions you can take at the bottom. Um, but us as organizers are always looking for people to take higher level actions and please get involved. Um, you know, it's it's great to join these events. Um, if everyone that joined these events were to write a handwritten letter to their member of Congress or, or all their members of Congress, um, post about nuclear weapons issues on Facebook, Twitter, uh, whatever social media you have, talk about it with friends and family. Nuclear weapons is not something that's fun to talk about. Um, and it's not necessarily a top issue for a lot of people. Um, what I find helps is I talk about how much spending is wasted. So if maybe nuclear weapons aren't somebody's first priority issue, but um, you know, say they are really into health, you know, they want to get health care or whatever their issue is, climate. I would say, you know, we're we're spending five million dollars an hour on nuclear weapons. Um, that could be money spent elsewhere, more helpful places. But yeah, just keeping the conversations going, getting involved with higher level actions, talking to your member of Congress, uh, maybe even doing a drop by, sharing reports. Uh, you know, you could print out the UCS report, three heads are better than one, and bring it down to your congressional office, get in touch with an organizer at UCS. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can, can get involved and help raise this uh, issue and the awareness around it. That's my uh, that's my <laughs> pitch for action, and I'll get back to some of these other questions here. Um, somebody asks, and this could I'll I'll put this out to either Elizabeth or Stephen. Um, would this action so would a presidential sole authority, if this was to change, would this action effectively end the first strike option? No, <laughs> the military. Well, in essence. Uh, if the military chooses to launch on warning of an incoming attack, uh, which there is some uncertainty about, uh, even if the sensors indicate that that's what's happening, uh, the, the option that they are offering the president will very likely, as, as we know, include uh, using those weapons before they can be destroyed. That would be a first use of those weapons because the other ones had not landed. Uh, and may never land if it's a false alert. Um, no, there are, you know, the U.S. has restricted its its policy uh, to use nuclear weapons first against a handful of countries. Um, they include for, because they're adversaries, um, and their policy is that the U.S. might respond with nuclear weapons to a conventional or chemical or biological attack. So that would be first use. And the countries that are on their very short list are Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran uh, is not is not on there now, I, I believe, but it goes on there if it is not in compliance with the non-proliferation treaty, uh, which is the treaty barring uh, nuclear weapons on the part of um, all countries that have signed, in fact, all countries have signed with uh, a few exceptions. Um, and so th that's the short list. That's the short list that the president, the military would consider for first use. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, we've got a lot of questions about the TPNW. I wanted to get one in here. Um, someone asked, where does this, where does all of this fit in with the TPNW? which is the treaty pre to prevent nuclear war and abolishing all nuclear weapons completely. I can take that. So yes, the, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which is a treaty that was initiated just a couple of years ago uh, by countries that were basically non-nuclear countries uh, who were uh, wanting to take control of the issue themselves. They, many of them were frustrated by the lack of progress uh, under the non-proliferation treaty that the U.S. 
but basically is the treaty that allows five countries to have nuclear weapons. The US, UK, France, China, and Russia are allowed under the non-proliferation treaty or NPT to have nuclear weapons, but they are at least nominally required to negotiate them away um, in good faith to move toward abolition. They clearly aren't doing that now in any fashion. And in fact, the opposite in many respects. And so countries were frustrated with um, that lack of progress under the NPT and created a new regime that actually would directly prohibit nuclear weapons called the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It was negotiated at the UN by about 120 countries and uh, entered into force, I think, last year when 50 countries ratified it um, uh, in their uh, native countries. So it is in force, but of course, none of the nuclear armed states have endorsed the treaty or joined the treaty. And in fact, they, for the most part, adamantly oppose it, unfortunately. Um, and so uh, there is um, no direct connection between sole authority and the TPNW. Um, the treaty, I'm sure, treaty supporters, I'm sure, would also support ending sole authority. Um, uh, and UCS is has publicly endorsed the treaty ourselves. We endorse TPNW. We're actually partners with uh, the primary NGO that helped lead the cause um, called the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. We are a partner group with them uh, to endorse the treaty. Uh, and so we are strong supporters of the treaty. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, all of the nuclear weapon states, uh, China being the least opposed to it, but others being pretty much adamantly opposed to it, um, I, I'm quite surprised by how negative overall the U.S. approach is to TPNW. I wish they were much more open to talking with them about how we could make progress, but generally they are not, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but I do think that it is a clear sign that most of the world is unhappy with nuclear weapon states and their continued reliance on nuclear weapons. I want the world to change, uh, but they have not yet found a trick to make that happen. Uh, I think the pressure will continue for those countries. And in particular, they're hoping to put pressure on the NATO allies um, who are nominally non-nuclear states, but through NATO um, uh, are under a nuclear umbrella. So uh, if there were some NATO countries who came, to, who attended the last or actually the first conference on the parties to the, T the TPNW uh, last year, there'll be another this year in New York. And I'm hoping that again, some other countries will attend at least to show up and to respect and interest in the process. But the US probably will not attend because the US simply doesn't think the treaty is valuable. They consider it in some ways a waste of time because they're not gonna join it. And so why focus on it at all? It's just not in their interest. I think it's a wrong approach, but it's just the reality, unfortunately. Can I jump in? Uh, I think the U.S. is terrified by this treaty. When it first came up for signature, the U.S. lobbied it, its allies hard so they wouldn't sign. It's terrified because the more countries that sign it, the less legitimate its arsenal is. And uh, it is both all the nuclear weapon states have sort of hidden under this uh, this requirement that they negotiate nuclear weapons away by saying, see, we're on our way, we've made cuts. Um, and the world, all the signatories say, mm, not good enough. And it really terrifies the US. So what they want to do is ignore it, because that's a way of dissing it, dissing the process. But they're terrified. And they work very hard to not get their allies to sign it. So they care. <laughs> yeah. I was just typing a, out the acronyms in the chat there for everybody to. Yeah. Go I ahead. hope I got them right. <laughs> cool. Um, somebody just asked a really interesting question in the chat. Let me scroll back to it here. Um, I had mentioned that this isn't a top nuclear weapons isn't a top issue necessarily. Um, but why isn't it, they say, um, if climate change represents an existential threat, doesn't nuclear annihilation, whether intentional or accidental, represent an even more immediate existential threat? That's a great question. I, go ahead. I, you can start this if you want. Uh, it's true. It's not in the public mind. In fact, if you ask them what 
what are their top concerns? Um, climate doesn't even make it. It's the economy, it's relations, it's uh, with Russia, with China, it's nuclear terrorism, or just plain terrorism. Um, I don't think, you know, in the height of the Cold War, it was ever present, ever present. It was on the front page all the time. There wasn't climate change. You know, people feared for their lives, really. Um, that's not true anymore, which is, in a way, it's a good thing. Um, and in another respect, <laughs> it precludes people from, you know, taking action and caring deeply about this. But, you know, you can't fault people, really, for being more concerned about climate change and some of these other things that are impacting their life right now. Right now, climate change is already having impacts, and you can see what's going to happen in the future. It's a given. It's a given. And nuclear war is not. It's, it would be horrible, but it's not a given. Just to add to that, I mean, there was, with the start of the Ukraine war and Putin's multiple nuclear illusions slash nuclear threats, there definitely was, for the first time in decades, increased awareness of nuclear threat. And there were polls showing people were very concerned about the possibly nuclear war. Um, but they also felt they had no ability to influence that. And so if they didn't feel empowered to be able to change anything. They didn't feel emboldened to act. And unfortunately, I think I had hopes that, that um, the nuclear threats Putin made would spark basically a, something like a nuclear freeze movement again, a, a mass concern being raised up to the public. I think it's still possible once the Ukraine war resolves, depending on how it plays out. People may say, I hope people will say, okay, the war is over now. This immediate threat has passed. Never again. We need to stop this. And so that's our intent, actually, is to try and push for that to happen. Once the Ukraine war resolves, and assuming that Russia does not um, go nuclear in that, in that time period, uh, and probably if Putin isn't president anymore, I'm hoping that both the public and international community will make a change and say, this isn't okay. We can't have a world where nuclear armed countries can wage nuclear wage conventional war without any limits. Uh, that's just not a, not a world we want to live in. And we should push for a world that, that that's not possible, which one would be one without nuclear weapons. But it's a heavy lift. And it's only sort of our aspirational dream at this point to have that happen down the road. But we're going we're gonna to work for it, definitely, for sure. I want to just throw something in again. Um, I mean, Putin has made references to using tactical nuclear weapons, that, which are short range, uh, and would be used on the battlefield. The U.S. also has these weapons, and they're deployed in Europe. They're, uh, they're bombs on aircraft, and they're deployed in Germany and uh, five, four other countries, Turkey, I think maybe they got them out of there, um, the ne Netherlands. And the point of these weapons is in part the NATO allies want the option of responding if there were a nuclear attack, and they could be used first because it would be Russia. Um, so everything is so complicated. Thanks, Elizabeth and Stephen. Any any uh, other last words? We're, we're coming up on the end here. A couple minutes left. I'll just say thanks everyone for joining. I do think it's an important issue. Um, I We do, I think, actually, as I said, I think it is possible we could win on this, given the politics of it and how Trump makes it an issue people do worry about. It says, still so unlikely, it's a heavy lift, but it is possible. So I'd encourage you to think about how you can join in this effort by writing a member of Congress and saying, hey, member of Congress, please tell the president to do the right thing. The more we do that, the more po the possibility could happen that we could have a president making a, soul, a change to sole authority that would make us all safer. So please think about that action step. And thanks everyone for coming. Well, more generally, the more this issue is out there, the more it's harder for the administration to ignore it. And even if they don't undertake it, getting this to be taken more seriously and more part of the dialogue makes it very hard for this to be ignored in the longer run. I hope too, and I do believe as Stephen says, it's possible for um, Biden to, to undertake such a thing. 
So, but only if enough people, which is not crowds on the street necessarily, but if, if enough of you make it clear that you care about this. Thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for your future activities. Thanks. I really appreciate the the push there for uh, people to stay involved and to keep this issue raised up. So thanks for that, Elizabeth. And thanks for, to our speakers. Thanks to everyone for, for joining. And we'll share around uh, the recording, I think, by tomorrow. Um, and also, please take an action if you can and stay in touch and be on the lookout for more Global Security Talk invites in the future. Thanks, all. Take care. Bye.